Hi, this is Joe Tate, and you're listening to The Sports Fix. Sports Fix listeners, do you tweet? So do we. So tweet with us 24-7 at The Sports Fix CLE. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Looking to upgrade your league trophy? Check out FantasyJocks.com for championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Live in Ohio, it's time to get your fix. The Sports Fix. Welcome in, everybody. We are on the air, baby. Here we go. Tuesday, off and running edition of the Sports Fix here. Going to be a compact. Here I go again every time I say this, but I'm pretty sure I'm going to keep my word on this one because I, I really have to. Uh, today's probably going to be a compact edition of the Sports Fix. We've still got Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com. We've got Dr. Football, Bill Checkis in the house. Doug Plagans, Doug, the uh, Lake Erie, yeah, there we go. Easy for me to say. Doug Plagans of the Lake Erie Monsters, usually with us on Tuesdays. Monsters have a game today, have a game Thursday. So we'll get Doug in here tomorrow in between, do a little bit of that, talk some Monsters hockey. So, But uh, a little bit under the weather here today, which is, hey, you know, rub some dirt on it, play hurt. Do have a basketball game here to call tonight, too. So I'm going to do my best to make sure that I can handle all of my obligations today, and uh, so it should be perhaps a uh, a nice bright and tight, as they say in the business. Addition to the sports fix today, still a whole lot to get into, a lot to talk about. As I said, Jeff Gorman, Dr. Football, you guys, me, doing the thing, so you ready to do it? Let's get off and running. Welcome in, you guys, to the sports fix. Maybe you're here every day. Perhaps today's your first time in. If it is, shame on you. Where have you been? What is wrong with you? But uh, just kidding. Welcome in, you guys. This is the Sports Fix. We do this each and every weekday, live at noon, Eastern Standard Time, across the Sports Fix radio network. I am your host, the Big Daddy on the microphone. Don't ask me why. I'll have to show you why. I'm the Big Daddy. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, I am Jerry Myers, your host, J-Rock. Call me whatever you want. I've got all kinds of nicknames here. Whatever it is, I'm glad we do this each and every day, and I'm glad you're here with us on the Sports Fix. And you are the voice of the Sports Fix, the heart and soul of the Sports Fix. Whether you're listening live on TuneIn and TuneIn's radio app or on Spreaker and Mixler, all of their digital respective and mobile applications some fantastic live places to listen to the show maybe you take us live right off the home base the sportsfix.net your one stop shop all things cleveland sports all of that all of our social media widgets the uh, the sportsfix.net is a, a good little uh, place as a resource for the sports fix so make sure you bookmark it there and check out our sponsor links and all of that stuff the sportsfix.net welcome in all of you as well thousands big portion of you guys listen on digital delay all around the world different countries different time zones all of that on digital delay places like iheart radio the world's largest internet radio provider on itunes on stitcher radio on soundcloud carplay all of the various uh, unique ways that you download this show, all of the myriad sites where you feed, subscribe, all of those nifty technological doohickeys that you guys do to get your fix every day. Thank you so much for doing it. And hey, do it with us. As I said, the whole spiel, being a part of the show, that's you guys. Pick up the phones, give us a call, 216-539-7535. Not just live, anytime, day or night. Something on your mind? Get it off with us, 216 216- 539-7535. We'll play things on the air if you call during the hours that we're not on. Always on social media, Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the sports fix. Tweet with us at 
the sports fix C L E email us the sports fix at AOL.com. Jeff Gorman, Indians 101.com going to join us. Uh, what? It's about 10, 12 minutes from now. But first off, a couple of things like to throw back to yesterday's show. A few of the things that we, uh, talked about and actually one kind of feeds right into the other that I wanted to get to anyway yesterday Dean Smith a lot of people uh, in the feedback that we got for our show you know each and every day love talking to you guys and by the way if you don't do that do it because I can't tell what you like what you well I mean I can by the numbers but you go in blind you don't you know you don't necessarily uh, I don't know what moments of the show you click forward, you you stick on, you fast forward. Maybe those of you live are held hostage. I don't know. But uh, let me know what you like, what you don't like. I love those conversations. Love to hear from you guys uh, as you listen to the show. So make sure you do that. A lot of people, though, talking about Dean Smith. We started off yesterday's show talking about him. And uh, I saw some uh, in yesterday's well, no, it would be today's whatever. Cleveland.com slash The Plain Dealer, whether you read it physically or online or whatever. Some different people's recollections. Saw some of the local area coaches, Coach Waters, talking about different meetings. Just uh, truly one of the men that transcends just what happens on the courts with what he did and how he affected young men and, and all. You know, Terry Pluto. And you guys know I'm, I've got a high level of respect for Terry Pluto and what he does, not just uh, the books that he's written, but locally too. I mean, I'll tell you what, it was a, he did a great, uh, uh, he not only writes sports for the, this is totally off the, off the, here I go with my ADD, off where I was just about to go. But over the weekend, he did a great one because he also does a faith column in The Plain Dealer. And uh, he had one that tugged at my heartstrings about uh, about the relationship with your dad. And, and, and that's one of the things, one of his books that I read back in the day that kind of really uh, attracted me to what he does. Uh, some similar kinship there with some stuff. But anyways, Terry's a great guy. And um, I was reading his recollections of the time that he went down and sat and had a chance to talk face-to-face with Dean Smith. And uh, one of the things that stuck out that he pointed in, it stuck out to him because he remembered it all those years later, was that on all the walls, and you, you know, yesterday we talked about it. Anybody that knows who Dean Smith is knows that list of all the NBA players, all the stars, the big coaches, the Hall of Fames, all of these guys that have been, you know, rubbing shoulders that have come through with Dean Smith, all the photo ops, all the presidents he's taken pictures with, all that stuff, right? Celebrities and uh and and trust me, I've interviewed a ton of got gone to the office and it's it's all they got, man. You know, it's all, you know, hey, look at me with this guy and that guy and this guy. And one of the things that struck Terry was that all over all Dean Smith had on the walls, but had a couple hundred of them. It was the same pose. It was the, I don't know if you'd say yearbook, but it was the headshot uh, of all of his players. It was 200 plus at the time. And this was back in the, uh, in the early nineties. He still had, I think four or five years left on the end of his career at that point. I think, yeah, I think this was like 93 Terry Pluto said it was, but no pictures of him saying, Hey, this is look at the pictures of me with the president. Look at the pictures of me with Michael Jordan and this guy and that guy. It was pictures. It was the headshots of all the lettermen that had come through, uh, not just the stars, all the lettermen that had come through his program and graduated through. And, and that's really, that's the stuff, man. And, uh, you know, Segway right in here in a minute with looking at a, a current guy like Greg Popovich. And I got to thinking about the two. And I remember it's easy now because, of course, all of the stuff that people need to talk about in the 24 7 news cycle, that stuff goes away when somebody passes. And all people remember is the stuff that they should remember the important stuff, the big stuff, and usually the good stuff. They forget that they were complaining about this guy and that guy because he was around too long, or he won too boring, or he did this, or he did that. Or in Dean Smith's case, he had the only system that could, he was the only coach that could hold Michael Jordan under 20 points, but it was because he coached him that way. But, you know, and I'd segue that into a guy like Popovich as Pop gets his thousandth uh, victory last night. And I, I think I've got a buddy of mine. We have some fun uh, because he can't stand the Spurs because they win and they're boring and fundamental and and blah, blah, blah. And we have fun with it. And he, he has fun with it as well. But uh, we always go back and forth with it. And he's like, ah, you and your Spurs and and uh, that boy, he kid Tim Duncan, all of that stuff. I, I jab him all the time and say, ah. Tim Duncan, how many rings does LeBron have? I just mess with him, you know what I mean? But anyways, um, but look at that. That kind. Of, there's a lot of that that pervades. And now I know 
when I say a name like a, like a Belichick, that's different because there's reasons some people don't like him. But even without that, the the long term success, people start to sour. Eh, they want to see the you know you know I get it, I get it. It's the build them up, tear them down, build them back up of the society and the media that we live in. But it just got me thinking because if you go back, like I said, uh, you if you were live real time in the late night or early nineties, late run of Dean Smith's career, you'd get those articles that were coming out about is it time he's had a legendary career has it passed him by is it this is it that uh things to complain about the system and and, then of course it led to the they created the shot clock there because of drawing the 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 long long boring possessions but my point is when whether any of those whatever it is sometimes and i don't mean just because you're great at something what i'm gonna say here i don't mean just because you're great at something you get a pass on everything and and we just you know bow at the altar but sometimes I just I know that after somebody passes, we talk about all these great things that they did. And it's like, yeah, I don't want to say appreciate it more while they're there. But some like like Greg Popovich, great example. I'm positive no matter what. All the people that like him, love him, respect him, or the ones that don't, the ones that say this, that, or the other thing, or he's boring, or he doesn't do this for me, or he doesn't do... I guarantee you, whenever down the road Greg Popovich passes away, you won't hear any of that. Of course you won't, because the only thing people will be talking about is how great of a coach, et cetera, so forth, all the things, a good man, all the things that you talk about. So my just, just my thought is, why not... Pay more attention to that now, like, because when you got greats and there's and great is different from very, very good. It's like we say about the Hall of Fame. It's not the Hall of a little bit better than average. It's not the 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 Hall of really good. It's the Hall of Fame. It's the greats. When you when you have greats of any era, you know, they're they're gone. Eventually they're gone. And I just I think about we do this all the time, you know, no matter who the player is here in Cleveland sports, everybody's got their players. And then 20 years later, nobody was as good as this guy or that guy or this guy. But back then, not everybody was saying that everybody had this to say or that to say. And it's just it's funny, man. It just makes I, I think about that. And it just in a good way, man, more awareness to just appreciate and understand some of the things. I'm, like I said, you don't give somebody a, a free pass. They can't just be a terrible human being just because they're the best at this sport or that or whatever. That, that doesn't fly either. But, you know, sometimes nitpicking, the, the minutia, it's just, you know, I don't know. Because you know later, none of that stuff matters. And, uh, you know, uh, again, there's good, there's great. But then when there's the greats, the true, true, true man. They don't make them like that, man. Appreciate them a little bit more, man. But they, so segue that into Greg Popovich, a thousand wins there. And uh, I was looking uh, one of the uh, was it? I think it was ESPN. They had an interesting breakdown of uh, of all of Greg Popovich's uh, victories and and how it broke down and uh, pretty amazing. And, uh, you know, again, last night getting his 1000th victory, only the ninth NBA coach to do that, but the third fastest as far as regular season victories. And uh, I'll tell you what, man, when you look, especially because Phil Jackson, who's, you know, one of the guys that is in the discussion, when you start looking at this individual era and you know, Willis pop the, the best coach of his era, uh, you know, of course, Phil Jackson's bucked up by all the rings that six, you know, three and three there with the Bulls. But when you go after that, from at the the tail end of those Bulls teams from ninety six ninety seven, uh, that's Popovich's thousand. When you look at Phil Jackson in that same run, uh, if Greg Popovich since he started since ninety six ninety seven in this run, he is two hundred and fifty four wins above the next tier of guys: George Carl, Phil Jackson, and. Uh, uh, that's a, that's an amazing gap there between the guys. And uh, when you look at the 50-win seasons in NBA history, Popovich, 16 50-win seasons, the only two in front of him, 
Phil Jackson, Pat Riley, and they each had one more 17 50 win seasons. So the next one there would tie him as the most. And it's funny, too. They even broke down his wins by opponent. So, of course, I had to go look. Cavs nowhere near at the top of the list because you got the Eastern Conference there. Uh, for those wondering, 24 and 11 is the win and loss for Coach Pop there against the Cavs teams over the. Uh, over the years here, but you know, looking even at the level of competition, 149 postseason victories, third in win percentage of, of coaches with 10 or more years of experience in total playoff games, in conference titles, and tied for third in championships with five. I mean, you know, just it helps to have Tim Duncan, by the way, the two of them most wins by a player coach combination in NBA history. Nine. 129 of those together between the two of them. So of those 1,000, baby, 929 of them came with uh, Timmy D there holding down the center. Not a bad guy to hold it. And you talk about the coaching trees, too. You look at uh, just at setting the threshold at 150 wins or more, six branches of the pop coaching tree, whether you're talking assistants or players that came up underneath him and then became coaches all over the 150 win mark themselves. You got Monty Williams, you got uh, Vinny Del Negro and Alvin Gentry and Avery Johnson and our boy Mike Brown, who's the winningest Greg Popovich uh, alumnus, you would say there off the tree, 347 victories for Coach Brown, as you guys know, here in Cleveland. And the climb continues, as I said, in the top 10 now, uh, tied or excuse me, above now into ninth place. You, you got to figure the next two in front of Coach Pop. You got Rick Adelman and Larry Brown. You know, Larry Brown's still 98 victories away, so you can you can measure that out to a couple of seasons. Rick Adelman, 42 victories to move into eighth place for Popovich. You got to figure somewhere in the first quarter or maybe a little longer than that of next season, that would be the next uh, milestone that would probably pop up. But uh, – you know, like I said, just something I thought with the two together and I thought back and I'm like, hey, I remember just like anybody else reading uh, Sports Illustrated uh, editorials and different things about Dean Smith at the end and hey, anywhere. It doesn't matter anywhere. You get that. And I just think, man, it's funny because you don't hear it. Of course, you don't hear any of that afterwards because all that matters is is what really mattered. And so I just think sometimes you got to realize what really matters now, man. That's what I thought it was a good example. But anyways, kudos, Coach Pop, a thousand victories there. And uh, one, I thought it was a good way to start the show. Mention that speaking of basketball, while we're talking about hoops, the other thing, throwing back to yesterday's show that I got a ton of feedback on was the Dolan letter, James Dolan and the letter that uh, he wrote scalding scalding letter to that fan i still can't believe it a lot of you guys we talked to last night those of you guys that hit me up over the uh over the night and uh, i'll tell you i thought it was i'm like man that's raw that was way too harsh for it was way too harsh no matter what the initial letter was about but man that was way too harsh so i saw that uh there's some buzz going on in New York that there's these things don't work. I'm just going to tell you now, but uh, it was the same people that did the whole big giant campaign to get John Idzik out of the general manager job for the Jets. Now they've zeroed their targets on James Dolan here after that email. Uh, there's the couple of guys that launched the same group of, it was different. It was all over social media. Remember they flew the plane over, they did all kinds of stuff. And, uh, it was a multi-platform deal where they attacked the jets to get the general manager out. Well, they're now locked onto this one. I don't see this working because how do you get, you can't make the top guy sell his company. You could, you can force a lot of change, but you can't force, I mean, Unless you get him on tape saying some racial stuff. I don't know how else you can force this guy out, you know. And even that took a while. But uh, they've launched nicksforsale.com. And uh, these guys, uh, let's see, Jason Koppel and his brother, a couple of other guys. It's a group of four or five people that have put this together. They're running a Twitter and a Facebook. They've got donations coming in. They're looking to raise twenty grand here this week so they can put up a billboard on 30th and 7th outside of Madison Square Garden so that they can uh, billboard and publicly call for the Knicks to be sold. They've got 
a smaller uh, banner hanging up here. I'm looking at it now uh, near Madison Square Garden with the nicksforsale.com website on it. And uh, they've got renderings of the billboard that they want to put up and all of that. And so and those things usually don't don't go well. I mean, for the most part, I mean, come on. How many times have you gotten emails or how many times have you gotten Facebook or change.org or whatever from a Browns fan that put together a petition? How many Dolans must sell the Indians or Lerner must sell the Browns? How many of those have you seen over the years? Because I can tell you dozens of them have come. And matter of fact, one of them got really viral. I remember uh one of those Dolans, I think, yeah, one of the Dolans must sell. I, I couldn't even remember who started it to tell you or anything like that. But uh, this thing got out there, started to get viral, had thousands and thousands of signatures on it. Who cares? I mean, I don't mean who cares like I don't care, but life doesn't care. Like, it doesn't matter how many virtual signatures you get. But, I mean, it's cool. It shows passion it shows civic passion and pride it shows that you care because i've always said uh anger hostility any of that from a fan base beats the hell out of apathy apathy means they don't care means they could not care at all about what your product is good bad ugly that is that's when you reach that point you're done when you reach the point of apathy your business is out of business you may not realize it yet but you're already out of business because nobody cares what you're doing as long as somebody's getting mad at you as long as somebody's getting frustrated it means that there's something salvageable there man you know i mean that's it sounds like the old oh well i only yell at you because i care but it's true trust me anger from a fan base even at its worst level even if they're flying banners over your stadium and telling you to sell your team it's way better than if they just don't care that your team exists i'm telling you trust me it's a that's a that's a road you don't want to go down but for the most part i can't see what how are you gonna how are you gonna get hey well you know fifty thousand people said you should sell the team say well that's great if i had a dollar for every one of them i'd still be rich i don't need a dollar for every one of those signatures you got he's not listening to that noise man anybody disdainful enough to talk to one of their fans like that couldn't couldn't care less if you get 50 or a hundred thousand or five hundred thousand fans together because he's the owner of the new york knicks and that's a drop in the bucket and the, the Knicks are a worldwide organization. I'm just saying, I agree with you, man. I mean, bring out the pitchforks. Run them out. I want to see where you can go with it. These guys got creative with Idzik, that's for sure, man. So go with it. Let's see what you can do, man. Go call LeBron, see if you can borrow one of those little remote control hummers and roll that thing in with a banner dragging behind it, you know. Knicks for sale. I don't know. Do what you got to do because we'll give us some fun stuff to talk about. But when the, when the owner doesn't care if you like him or not, there's nothing you can do about that. There's nothing you can do about that. Sell your season tickets because he's making a fool out of all of you. But you're not. I mean, the Knicks, hey, look, say what you want. That's a proud franchise. I mean, I know Knicks fans that, that if, you know, I've met on Facebook and talked to for years, guys from that area. They're just like, hey, man, hardcore. I've been going for, you know, they get that Bronx accent. They've had their they've had their nosebleed seats for decades, and they're not going, you know, we talked to Dan Wismar about, what do you say, 27 years he's been doing the, the Browns ticket thing. He's not going anywhere. This is my team, not yours, but uh, the owner doesn't share your opinion, and that sucks because you have to choose, and that's what we talked about. Dan brought it up. with You have to choose walking away from something you love because some idiots got a hold of it, and that's a choice that uh, is a tough one for guys to make. And I applaud the ones that don't. I applaud the ones that do, too, because speaking with your pocketbook does the most to these owners. But, I mean, it really does. Seriously. I mean, the Indians only spent that money a couple of years ago because they knew they were at that drop-off point where we they knew it could have got worse. And even then... It was just a flotation device from where they were. Um, so, yeah, I often advocate, hey, if everybody stops spending money on the Browns, you bet your bottom dollar they'd fix things real freaking quick. But that's never going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so 
I don't know. And this isn't going to work either. But go for it. Like I said, those cats got creative with the Jets. I mean, it'd be fi- kind of uh, interesting to see what they do here. We'll talk some more about that in a little bit. And we'll talk some Cavaliers. Take a, yeah, kind of a, a, a breath from the Cavs here today as they get a breath. All them games they played, six in the last eight days. Tomorrow, you got the Heat, and then you get the Bulls wrapping up the first half of the season. Eddie Jansen from More Than a Fan Cleveland. He'll be with us here. I believe Eddie's going to join us on Thursday in between the uh, – the deals there so we'll talk some Cavs hoops we'll look ahead to the heat tomorrow and all that right now let's take a break when we come back Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com joins us here and we're going to talk some Indians baseball baseball stuff in general as Jeff's looking around to see who the uh, with shields coming off the board who is still available who are the top free agents remaining as we head into camp here because that's starting to be a thing here more and more. We'll talk about that Indian stuff and the Julio sighting. And Julio Franco still playing some ball, man. I'm telling you, Julio Franco will be the only person playing baseball at his own funeral. I'm telling you, he's going to want to play too that day just to celebrate the life that he had. Julio. We'll talk about all of that and more with Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com joining us. Dr. Football Bill Check is still to come and so much more. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back here live on The Fix. Jeff Gorman, Indians101.com, coming up next. The Sports Fix, the show that asks the question. What you talking about, huh? What you talking about, huh? What you talking about? What you talking about? We'll be right back. Hey guys, before we go to the break, I want to talk to you a little bit again about our good friends at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead, the UFC, the ultimate fighting championships, some of the hottest fights in the world today, each and every one of their huge events. Harry Buffalo is one of the few places in Northeast Ohio you can go there and watch each and every UFC fight at the Harry Buffalo. And let me tell you, I've been there. The people are out the door. They are to the rafters. It is one of the craziest environments for some UFC fights. Wing Mondays, they've got great deals on wings and drinks. And every day of the week, there's a different special, a different deal. And don't forget the Bison Burger, the unbelievable. It is the combination of a fantastic burger and eating healthy combined into one unbelievable sandwich you have got to get a bison burger while you're there so whatever you're looking for whatever day of the week monday through friday saturday sundays there's something for you at the harry buffalo north olmstead just outside great northern mall check them out today harry buffalo join the herd sports fix listeners like us on facebook today facebook.com slash the sports fix i'm little teapot short and stout. Here is my handle and here is my spout. No, Dad, like this. When I get all steamed up, then I shout, tip me over and they pull me out. <laughs> this is WWE superstar Roman Reigns. The smallest moments can have the biggest impact on a child's life. Take time to be a dad today. Visit fatherhood.gov. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and And starts starts getting getting real. real. And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. I mean, a really real prize. Nobody Nobody does does that that like like Fantasy Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. There's literally only one place to go. FantasyJocks.com No football? No problem at Harry Buffalo North Olmstead. The excitement never stops. Every day of the week brings a different set of food and amazing drink specials. Fight fans, Harry Buffalo North Olmstead is the home for every UFC pay-per-view live on the big screens. And let's not forget their mouth-watering trademark, the Bison Burger. Nobody does bison like Harry Buffalo. The perfect combination of healthy and delicious. What are you waiting for? Get to Harry Buffalo, just outside Great Northern Mall today. Harry Buffalo, Buffalo. Join the herd. Join the herd. Hello, Cleveland. This is WWE Hall of Famer Mick Foley, and you are listening to the Sports Fix. Yeah! Indian fever is catching fire with everyone. Indian fever, you can be part of the fun. 
Welcome back into the Sports Fix Live. J-Rock with you here as we roll on, getting ready to be joined by Jeff Gorman. As I knock, let's just go ahead and knock everything off the uh, studio desk here. Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com is going to join us. The uh, Again, I'll preface it by saying I don't know if the fever is exactly stoked yet, but it's warming up. The smoke is coming from the wigwam. I don't know. Can I, can I still say that? Are, am I allowed to still make those references? I am. I don't care who likes it or not, but uh, well, psh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint. Uh, Indians fans are going to love it. Everybody else may not appreciate my next uh, pro wrestling promo that I'm working on here because my backdrop is, uh, well, let's just say a certain, assuming plans don't change, a certain unapproved somebody is a... Uh, Peering over my shoulder the entire time. Yeah, wait till you see it. Uh, but anyways, uh, yeah, some Indians fans will dig it, but I don't know. Some other people may not. Anyways, I don't care. Y'all know where I'm at on that. And uh, enough said. You'll just have to. Now the intrigue is up there. But uh, anyways, I'm using the uh, my buddy Wahoo as a backdrop on something for uh, something I'm working on for wrestling. I'll show you guys about that later. Anyways, back into the show here. I can hear the, 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 the people go, what? What is he even talking about? You'll see what I'm talking about. J-Rock back with you. Jeff Gorman joining me. You can join us on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash The Sports Fix. Tweet with us at The Sports Fix CLE. Me and my big buddy here over my shoulder. And Jeff Gorman talking some tribe. Talking some baseball. Talk, yeah, it warms you up just to use those words. Just, uh... Hair over a week away from these people. They have to legally be, they legally have to report to spring training. They have no choice but to be there. Well, most of them anyway. Let's do it. Jeff Gorman, talking some tribe, Indians101.com. Jeff, how you doing, buddy? I'm doing great, J Rock. You know, it seems like the long, cold winter is never going to end, but the long, cold winter without baseball is almost going to end. It's very exciting. We're almost at the point where we can see people on TV, or even in still photos, in a beautiful, sunny, warm climate, throwing the baseball around. And that's a Absolutely. wonderful thing. Wonderful thing. I can't lie. I was disheartened this morning because the weekend, the, the, the snow almost all melted away. I said, man, this is it, man. That's it. We'll melt this huh. away, and it looks ugly, and then we'll, we'll be, we'll, man, it's time. We're talking baseball. It's time. And then I wake up this morning. It's coming down again. I say, you got to be kidding me, really. I mean, it wasn't a, a truckload of snow, but it was enough to go, you know, these these doggone rodents need to make. I was telling, t- talking about that yesterday with Dan Wismar. How are we supposed to know which way to turn when you've got two different rodents whose job it is is to be meteorological experts and they're each going a different direction? The cat in PA sees a shadow. The one in Cleveland or in Ohio doesn't. Who are we going with? It doesn't matter. Because baseball says winter's almost over. I don't care what those rodents say. Right. I guess that uh, I guess the moral of the story is, is uh, not to be able to take your, your weather cues from uh, and from animals. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. We're, 2015, they can't get it right with Doppler 6000, but we're going to trust the groundhog. You know, come on, man. I mean, nobody could ever explain to me, by the way, how that works because – doesn't it, which way he's going to see the sun and the shadow, it just matters on where he comes out of the hole. Like, like if he comes out early on the east, he's going to see a shadow more likely than if it's later in the wet. I'm just saying. But anyways, it doesn't matter because baseball says we don't need no stinking groundhog. We know it's warming up. And as you said, man, I can feel it starting to heat up already. A lot of people are like, man, still a long way to go. That's fine. But we've already come a long way. Look at how much the winter is behind us, man. I mean, here it just uh, feels like yesterday. We were wrapping things up and looking ahead. And not a whole lot different here for the Indians. They've made a few moves. And, and I'm very interested to see how this roster comes together. But uh, you and I haven't talked since the last uh, couple of free agents. I know James Shields goes out to San Diego as the Padres just continue to open up the bank account and, and open up the vault and go to work out there. But uh, that changes some things. As now two pitchers have left the division here, you know, and uh, some big stuff. Scherzer leaving. I mean, things in play. Victor Martinez goes down since the last time we talked. Uh, still a few guys out there. Talk to me a bit here. A week before spring training gets started, what are your thoughts on those things? And who's left out there? I know you've been looking at some of the guys excuse me, some of the guys that are still available for teams heading into spring training. 
That's right. It's kind of amazing that anybody is still available because during spring training is going to start pretty much next week. But really the important thing that everybody's been watching for the Indians and it has finally come to fruition is uh, Max Scherzer and James Fields leaving the division. I always had to hold your breath because there was, of course, a chance that they could re-sign with their previous teams. They could switch teams. They could go to the Tigers and the Royals or, or even the White Sox, somewhere else in the division. But to have those two super top starting pitchers both be not only out of the division but out of the entire league, both of them going to the National League, that really helps the Indians. That really, you know, really downgrades the, the starting rotation of these other two top contending teams. And, of course, when you've got Corey Kluber, the Cy Young Award winner coming back, you know, that means he's the top pitcher in the division, and he's got him. So that's pretty much very well um, heartening. I mean, we can talk in a little bit about, you know, some of the other people that are out there, but right now it's a big situation where it's the Indians getting an addition by the Royals and Tigers subtraction. Oh, absolutely. You know, Mike Brandenberry and I talked a little bit about that earlier in the week. Combined, too, some of that with... Th- and you know what? Whatever. We're not going to go down the whole salary and equity uh, tract, but, you know, Victor Martinez goes down. And, of course, something to worry about, but I, I was... I was, I like to look sometimes when things happen. I like to go find, just like we've got, you know, the plane dealer. I like to go to the local newspapers websites and i like to see things from not how people in cleveland or even people nationally are talking about i like to like go to detroit and see are they flipping out about victor martinez or go wherever it may be you know because you do you have to go get that local perspective too when you're talking about things and seeing where people are and uh, yeah something for them to worry about but i i just chuckle at the well you know he'll be down a couple of i mean imagine the tribe signing somebody to a bigger deal, like or even Victor, and then that happens. It'd be the sky is falling. Three whole months he's down, but you know, kind of rolls off the back there. Just like uh, I got a same similar situation looking at some of the stuff out of New York and uh, the talk about Tanaka coming back here. And uh, you know, again, here's a guy who signed a hundred and fifty-five million dollar contract, and. Uh, you know, was rocking and rolling, and then goes down, tears the ligament in the elbow, comes back. Very scary, the way he looked when he came back. You know, obviously, you've got opportunities to build him back up. But, but again, listening to them talk, and what else are you going to say, but we hope these guys come back. But uh, I just I laugh because you can breathe easier uh, in those markets, when 155 million dollars is up for grabs, I mean, look at the look at the Yanks. They got the situation with Tanaka, and they got CC and his breakdowns that are going on as well, coming off of a, a worst season basically in his career last year. And you know, it's 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 I don't know. That's a higher level of boy. We hope Nick Swisher bounces back. That's a that's a high level. We hope somebody bounces back. You know, I mean, it just again points to the inequities it is what it is can't cry about it but those things are just blatant when you can when you can lose guys like that and go okay it hurts but you know we'll get them back. And again i just look at it and i go yeah that would be a disaster for certain markets if uh those big ticket guys as we see by example start to break down right and just talking about the tigers you know with victor martinez going down but you remember Hey, they've got Yoannis Cespedes now, so he just Your boy. adds to their their uh, offense, and so he's going to come in and help them out. They didn't really lose a whole lot from their offense, so you know he's going to help to pick up the slack until you know Victor comes back. So again, you have that situation where they've got pretty much an embarrassment of riches, where you know not everybody has yeah. to be contributing, not everybody has to be healthy, especially when you have somebody like Miguel Cabrera on the team. But you know it's the same situation with you know the uh, Red Sox and those Yankees, where you know. They've got so much money out there and so much talent out there that, you know, not everybody has to be, you know, even healthy, considering how much money the Yankees even have wasted on A-Rod. But, you know, of course, with the Indians, you know, everybody's got to be healthy. Go everybody's got some pearls. You didn't even. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit that last part. Oh, you, go you, ahead, just hit, you said a Rod. I said I didn't even mention him. Yankees are dealing with these pitchers, and oh yeah, by the way, we owe this cat a ridiculous amount of money too. We're just hoping he can show up and swing a bat every once in a while. You know, it just embarrassment of riches. Is, it makes it sound cuter 
than what it actually is. You know, it's disgusting when you think about it. And the, you know what, though? Off of that subject, because I can get mad real quick talking about the salary inequities of baseball, but Mike Brandenberry, he said it, and I'm with it, and I'm curious where you are, too. This is not uh, homerism coming here when I say this about the Tigers looking at it from the Indians' perspective, but uh, he's right. That Tigers team is in a very precarious position because they can not only get old, but they can get old very, very quick. Uh, especially like this season, if things don't roll right. You've got a lot of guys, uh, even with Victor coming back, you've got other guys, Cabrera, guys with injury issues. This this team could fall into a one of those high high pay, low result uh, type of situations really quick here. Right, and the team that really jumps to mind when you mention that is the Philadelphia Phillies. You know, they've had uh, yeah, some good yeah. success. You know, especially with their hitters, everything's going really well, putting together a few good seasons in a row. But then, you know, everybody starts breaking down, and you've got these real high-dollar contracts that aren't producing for you, and then it just really starts to fall apart really quickly. And, you know, that's something that the Tigers could fall into that trap because, you know, winning the uh, division four years in a row, you're going to want to keep those guys together, and you're going to have to spend a lot of money to keep them together. But again, once, you know, as time goes on and marches on and people's bodies break down, then you start to, you know, they don't have as big resources as, say, you know, the Yankees, the Dodgers, and, and the Red Sox. And eventually, those injuries are going to start to take their toll because eventually, it, you know, you don't have the resources to make up for those injuries. And you know what? Here's another uh, way that I'm looking at it, too, is when you look at a team like the Tiger, and they're already there anyway with the Indians and the Royals particularly, nipping right at their heels last year, the year before. Um, now you got Chicago starting to build their way back up, too. But when you think about you know the Tigers and the veteran-type team with big boppers, I mean, that's the kind of team a lot like uh, for a couple of years there, like those Indians teams in the nineties where the regular oh, yeah. season, the regular season was let's hang out and hit a whole bunch of home runs and sell a bunch of tickets and get to the playoffs. And then we'll, we'll see how far we can go. And, uh, you're able to a veteran club can handle. I'm not saying there's less stress, but when you're rolling the division by double digits, and when you don't really have a lot of, you know, you're rolling the Indians by ten games in the season series, and so on and so forth, like he did a couple years ago, uh, you're able to rest. You're able to not even just rest, but those veterans can. I, I know there's not any difference in how you play baseball from day to day, but there is in the urgency. And when you get into a situation where you get two or three clubs here, like you're going to have this season, especially the Indians and the Royals have a lot of younger guys, a lot of they're, they're going to be, they're going to be nipping at those heels. And so when you're in a less, a less relaxed situation, when you're actually fighting for that division, fighting for that playoff spot and not just getting to it and then performing in the postseason, break guys get hurt because you work a little harder. You push a little harder. You start to panic. Those veterans get out of that comfort zone and they start they start pushing the clock back like, hey, I remember, okay, we got to we gotta pick it up. We're in a pennant race. And next thing you know, more breakdowns because guys are putting for it, – it's a different level of effort when you got teams nipping at your heels as when you're running away with it all season long. Right, and the best you know example of that is not even from baseball. It's with a team like the San Antonio Spurs. You know, it's a different scenario in basketball where it's really a foregone conclusion that you're going to make the playoffs. And you can sort of take that long view of, you know, let's just keep these guys healthy, keep things moving along so that when the playoffs hit, we get everybody together, everybody's well-rested, and we win the championship, which is exactly what the Spurs did. And, but, you know, in a situation like this, if you find yourself in a dogfight, you're not thinking two or three months down the road. You're thinking two or three days down the road. Right. And you say, we got to win. And we've got to, you know, because teams are on our heels, we've got to win from a day-to-day basis. And, you know, it gets, it gets tougher. And again, you, like you said, you push people a little bit harder and you don't get to set things up for the future. You have to battle just for today. And it'll be interesting to see if the Royals and the Indians and possibly even the White Sox can put that kind of pressure on the Tigers so that they can't get into that comfort zone. 
Yeah, these team, this division, these teams have to know whether everyone came back to the middle, if you want to look at the negative side of it, or whether everybody improved in various ways. No matter how you want to look at it, there's a very, to me, and, and smaller than ever now with the, the last few weeks and the way things went with the official defection of Scherzer and now, you know, Martinez adding. And it's also the previous previously surgically repaired leg, too, which always gives you more. Not only did he have the surgery, but he also had the microfracture as, as well. So, man, now you've got a third deal on that leg, man. I'm just saying, guys, legs go, they get old really fast. And I love Victor, and I hope nothing but... I, I know this sounds stupid because he plays for the Tigers, but I hope nothing but the best for him. I hope he comes back and can play baseball. I don't ever want to see a guy get hurt, but, man, uh, when the legs go, that's... Uh, that's a tough one there, man. But uh, these teams know whether, like I said, however you want to look at it, coming back to the middle or, or whatever, the window's wide open for whoever. And Minnesota may be too young, but the window's wide open for whoever goes and gets it here in this division this season. Right. And, you know, maybe the White Sox might be maybe one year away because you got to remember, right, uh, despite right. the fact Absolutely. that they brought in some really good guys and they didn't really lose anybody. you got to remember, last year they were 16 games below 500, so I don't see them going all the way up to chance, but what they can do is, they can put some heat on teams, maybe they, they might last sort of around the middle of the season, maybe close to the All-Star break, they might be able to put pressure on people before possibly tailing off down the end, simply because some of their other guys are, you know, still need a little more time to mature, but you know, they could, they could make things kind of ugly, and I think the real wild card no pun intended, is the Royals. Because, you know, considering they won the pennant and everything, but, you know, losing Shields, you know, they did bring in Edison Volquez. I think that, you know, with some of the other defections on the team, with, you know, Billy Butler moving on, Nori Aoki moving on, I think the Royals, you know, they just had all that magic last year, and you just can't expect that to happen again. So I kind of see the Royals possibly falling back, and it might end up ultimately being a two-team race, hopefully, between the Indians and the Tigers. Yeah, going to be very interested to see a lot of, I mean, obviously, all these other teams, their questions that we're throwing out, there's just as many and, and twice as many that we can speculate about the Indians. That's why I can't wait for them to start throwing that ball around and start getting things warmed up next week because there's, whether it's the outfield position, so where are things going to settle? Who's going to settle in at first? Who's going to get most of the DH at bats? What's going to be your rotation? How's this bullpen going to shake down? You know, all all questions. You know, are you still going to have the defensive ability or inability early, or are you going to look more like the team that you did at the end of last season? Is Again, this sounds stupid, but it doesn't matter. I didn't ask the Indians to plan on a comeback for Nick Swisher, so don't get mad at me for saying this, but there's another one. Are you going to get that? Are you going to get Nick Swisher and Michael Bourne back to even what you just got from them the first season that you signed them? All of those things are going to determine how far the, the tribe goes. You know, Now, I do think that the Indians are deeper than usual. I do think that they've given themselves a get. This is what they want. And whether Tribe fans like it or not, and it drives me nuts too, this is what they want. They've got a chance to come in with a roster of 24 guys, 25, that they think is really more like 28 because they like flexibility. They like guys that can play two, three, four different positions. And they want to give Terry Francona a whole bunch of tools and say, you figure out where to use the hammer, where to use the screwdriver, where to use the pliers. And, uh, you know, a lot of people don't like it. I get that. But, you know, from what they're trying to do, I think that they are coming into camp with what they're happy with. I don't know what this is going to turn into. That's why I can't wait to see them start to shake out a little bit. And it's not just going to be spring training and training camp. It's going to be the first, you know, quarter pole of the season, really, before you start to see how things settle in. I know it's very interesting on paper, and it's going to be fun to actually watch, and not just the Indians, but the other teams in the division. And, you know, I think the way the Indians have things set up, you know, when you think about who are, what are some of kind of the biggest question marks going into spring training, and, you know, I think that the Indians are built right now where they don't need Nick Swisher to come back and have a big year in order to contend. And I know that sounds kind of crazy considering the money they've given him, but considering that, you know, he is coming in as your starting DH. But I think that you, you figure the Indians came pretty close to making the playoffs last year 
with very little contribution from him. So yeah. I think the way, the fact that he's set up as the DH, and there's so many other guys that are you know on this team going to get some at bats and could easily slide into that spot if Swisher is either a complete bust or you know is completely injured again. I think that you know Swisher may be in a situation where he's kind of able to help out. He's kind of going to be gravy, but I don't think the Indians are going to be completely sunk if Swisher doesn't come back in a big way. And that's, that's heartening. I don't, think, I don't think the Indians' hopes are definitely riding on the knees of Nick Swisher. I think that's good news. I got to tell you, I hope you're right about that, man, because, I mean, that's a difference in how you look at that. Still, um, either way, I wish we weren't having that discussion, but we are. It's all yeah. good. <laughs> Ohio. Go do your thing and whatever. But we'll see. Cannot wait, as I said, man, to we've reached the point where you have talked about it enough. Let's get out there and uh, let's see how it starts uh, shaking itself out, man. Speaking of, by the way, uh, Indians, I got to I got to do this. I don't know if you, oh, you probably didn't because you weren't uh, you weren't on the uh, on the other end of the feed until we hit the break. But I was talking right before the break and uh, away from guys. That, although he is available. Uh, available for autograph appearances and pinch hitting appearances worldwide. Julio Franco, my man. I don't know if I don't know if you saw or not, but Julio Franco out there. I said before the break, I was joking. I said he's gonna play baseball at his own funeral, man. He's gonna entertain the cats that are there to say goodbye to Julio Franco. He is still playing ball. He's playing semi pro ball in Japan. He's a player manager. Last year, he was playing for an independent uh, team, the Fort Worth uh, Wildcats, and uh, played seven games for an independent league, minor league baseball. I mean, say what you want. My man is 56 and a half years old, and he played Jeez. seven games at the independent level. I mean, that's still a high level compared to you know the average guys out there playing but that's still high level organized ball at that level and he was able to play last summer 56 years old he collects a paycheck every week for playing baseball that is amazing you mentioned Julio Franco I can still see him in that signature batting stance that real yeah. super upright stance yep. you know <laughs> I, I know that they have getting a statue of you know Jim Tomey and everything but I want to see somebody even some minor league team erect a Julio Franco statue with that batting stance. I think that batting stance should be immortalized forever. No, you know what I've been saying for years is a bobblehead. Do the bobblehead, but instead of a bobblehead, twist Julio's body up so that when it bobbles, it like bobbles in a twisty, like around in that serpentine, like pose that he makes. I'm with you there. That's what he's known yeah. for. And uh, yeah, Bruce in the chat room, that team that I was just mentioning from Fort Worth, that's the team that Scott Casimir rehabbed himself for the year before the Indians signed him and brought him into camp, which would have been three seasons ago. And then the tribe signed Casimir two years ago. So that was the same independent league team there. I believe that's the team that uh, I think that's the one Roger Clemens played for a little bit there too. They're big on getting guys there at that uh, right when they're trying to come back. But anyways, 56 years old. Julio Franco, I got his huh. his uh, little bio here. 1982. How old were you? Not you. Just you guys listening. How old were you in 1982? Because that's when Julio Franco first started playing baseball, man. And uh, check this out. 22 years later, 2004, in a part-time role, he hits 309 at the age of 46, hits over 300. From 82 to 2004, played in Major League Baseball until he was a hair before his 50th birthday. Major League Ball, brother, until he was 49 and a half years old. Man, Julio has over 20, almost 2,600 Major League hits plus a couple hundred more Japanese hits as well. He's got some they've got hits in different countries. He's got 2586 here in the in the majors. He's got nearly 300 in Japan. He's got another 156 in Korea, in Mexico. He's got 178. So, if you add up all of his foreign hits as well, he's uh closing in on the 3000 hit mark for sure there and uh uh, it's just amazing when you when you think about that. Uh, one of the notes I saw here on the article about him, one of Julio's teammates in his rookie season was a on-his-way-out 41-year-old Pete Rose, brother. And, Whoa. Uh, 
Yeah, and they played the uh, six degrees of separation. You've only got to go three teammates back to go all the way back to the beginning of baseball, back to the Civil War from Julio Franco. <laughs> you, you know that old David, you know, the old, you know, if you you know, acted with this guy and that guy and this guy, then you were with Kevin right. Bacon. Same thing there. You can make three connections to connect Julio Franco to the Civil War, brother. That's uh, That's how long he's been playing baseball. But is that amazing or what? That is fantastic. See, now I want them to open a senior's wing of the Baseball Hall of Fame, including Julio Franco, Jesse Orozco, and Manny Minoso. Jesse Orozco. Minoso, you know what? I saw the game that he played against the uh, the Indians. Uh, I can't really? remember. Early. Well, it was No, it was one of those gimmicks. He was doing the yeah. deal where he played... Uh, in a couple to add the decades to it. Oh, you know yeah, what? I don't want to misspeak, but yeah, he played a couple of extra games, and I I remember that. Yeah, um, that was I was a kid, but I just I remember it didn't I didn't understand why it was a big deal then. But yeah, but uh, Jesse Arasco, <laughs> was, too, the White that Sox, was a guy. Right? I- yeah, Minosa yeah, with absolutely. the White Sox. Doing yeah, that. yeah, because I yeah, absolutely, man. Those ugly '80s uh, White Sox uniforms. Yeah, uh-huh. man. Yeah, absolutely. And Jesse <laughs> Orozco, he was timeless too. That's a good name drop right there. Uh, I remember Orozco playing for the uh, for the Tribe. Oh, yeah, I and mean, he just kept going almost through the age of fifty with the Mets. I'm telling you, man. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that? I still say. In, in in a different sport, but I know it's a different sport here. Uh, Michael Jordan, I'm telling you, he could come down at 50. He's not dunking. He's not driving the lane. He's playing 12 to 15 minutes a night. He's shooting pull-up jumpers and foul shots all day long. Michael Jordan, 50 years old, can still average double digits in the NBA right now. I guarantee you, bro. Some people have just got that it and then he and that's but Julio 56 still rolling in real professional we throw the ball 90 mile an hour leagues that's amazing it's not just that part you just mentioned the throwing the ball 90 some miles an hour and be able to have that kind of reaction time when you're in your mid 50s is just mind-boggling you know I mean seriously that's that's cool man um Again, I don't want to say I hope that I can still do all the things I love. I mean, radio you can do it literally forever, but uh, uh, wrestling not so much because at that po- at that point, right. uh, I don't want to be out there at fifty six. I don't know what I'd look like, but I don't think it would be pretty. But uh, anyway, but if I could still do it like Julio, you have to drag me kicking and screaming. I can tell you that if I'm still in shape like Julio Franco and I can still go at that age. You, you'll never get rid of me. You'll never get rid of me. I'm just telling you that now, man. You know what and, I mean? Yeah, and you'll probably win some battle royals because you can say, hey, I can't go over the top rope. I got to win, just like Iron Sheik at WrestleMania 17. When it's, I'm just saying, man, when it's over, it's over. And Julio understands that. When it's over, it's over, man. So don't ever let anybody take whatever it is. that you Don't let nobody else take it because they can't have it. The hell with them, man. You do what you got to do, and you do it. For as long as you can do it, and you can do it until you're 60 if you're Julio Franco, man. And uh, anyways, I just I wanted to bring that up with you. I got to kick about kick out of that here. And uh, man, I, it was good. We sat here, here, man. Look at that, because you and I do the Browns thing, the Indians thing. We just went 31 minutes here talking about nothing but good, free flowing baseball thoughts, warm weather thoughts. Doesn't it feel good? It was like a like a woosa moment here, man. I mean, that was a it was good. It was good, man. Oh I'm yeah. With it. Next week, next week it's baseball time, baby. As uh, yep. uh, the official pitchers and catchers report, we're technically eight days away, but it don't matter. They're already down there. They're cheating. They're already down there playing now. They just can't tell anybody. They don't want to get in trouble. They don't want to lose any. Don't want to text anybody and lose any draft picks or anything like that. But right. they're already down there. They're already down there getting ready now, man. I'm fired up. I can't wait, man. I cannot wait. By the way, man, what do you think? Do you? I said yesterday, let, I'll leave this here and then we can talk some more later, but uh, I told Dan Wismar, I still think you've talked, I've talked, and Brandenberry, we've all kind of said all winter that we saw the Indians making a deal. You got a surplus at a couple of places here, as we know. You got a couple of piles of players where it's not, they're not all coming to uh, to the opening day lineup. So do you still see, I see a trade coming maybe two-thirds of the way through training camp. Once they look and they figure out, the way they're going to go, man, I, I still think they've got a, an acquisition here to make. But what do you think, man? Do you think they're pretty set, or do you think we'll still see some more roster maneuvering here over the next three or four weeks? I think the Indians are pretty set. I think that if okay. they 
get some kind of really catastrophic injury in the first two or three weeks of spring training, they might do something. But I think they're really happy with the guys they have, and they really just want to see how these guys all shake out, and not just the ones from the major league roster. See if anybody's going to challenge them coming up from the minors. Anyone's going to try to, or some of the people that they've signed to, you know, uh, minor league contracts. See if anyone's going to push to get on this roster because then you have a situation where. You've got an overabundance of talent. You've got a few extra people that you could possibly trade for, you know, whatever it is you need the most. So I think that they're probably not going to make a big deal unless, um, unless like, somebody gets hurt. But, you know, if we talk about maybe real quick some of the people who are still out there. The one That's name that really jumped off the page of me was Ryan Vogel's song. And I'm really kind of surprised that nobody has signed him yet. I mean, he's been with the three-time champions, the Giants. He didn't have a great year last year. But he already yeah. was four. And, you know, I know that uh, that uh, Gavin Floyd is pretty much taking that veteran spot for the uh, Indians. But, you know, considering the time is running so short, you might be able to get him for a relatively affordable price. And, you know, you can never have too much starting pitching. Absolutely. There's a, a lot of guys, a couple outfielders out there I saw. Uh, obviously, Shields comes off the board. But uh, uh, who else, by the way, who else would you put at the top of that list that you expect uh, to find homes here relatively quickly in spring training? Well, probably a couple of the top relievers, guys like Rafael Soriano, who was yeah. with the Nationals, saving 35 games, and Casey Jansen with the J. If he saved something like 28 games, I'm really surprised that those guys uh, haven't been picked up by somebody. And they're going to probably – you know, get picked up on the cheap, but they might, you know, really help somebody out down the down the stretch. Not a whole lot of great hitters still out there. There's still, you know, Colby Rasmus and Ricky Weeks, but I don't think that's anything that the Indians don't already have on the roster. Yeah, for sure, man. It's going to be interesting to see where those guys shake out and who comes up. You know what? Maybe next week, here's something for you, because uh, you mentioned about potential if somebody gets hurt in the first couple weeks of camp, but those young guys, as you say, not just the veterans here, um, maybe we'll talk next week. A couple of guys that you maybe some dark, some dark horse, some sleepers of who you think yeah. has a shot to come up out of nowhere and be that cat that makes this team. You know, I, Mike Brandenberry said, "Hey, Tyler Holt may be that guy here." I think he thinks Tyler Holt may may have a few things to say about how the opening day roster shakes out. So maybe next week we'll look within the Indians and look at some of the guys that nobody's maybe talking about and see if we think anybody has a chance to at least say, "Hey." I'm knocking on the door if if nothing else. That sounds like a good plan because, you know, as the season goes on and people tend to break down, you're going to need more than just those first 25 guys. And, you know, everybody makes a big deal over who makes the opening day roster, but you're going to need at least another 8 to 10 guys. And there's some of those guys going to have to play some big, serious roles, just like Jose Ramirez did this past year. Absolutely. So next week, Jeff Gorman and I will look at, hey, we're going into spring training. All these guys say, hey, all right, we're going in spring training. Fans go, it's time for some baseball. Which players are coming into spring training without a job that have a chance to get a job by the time spring training's over? We'll talk about some of those guys next week and whatever else may come up between now and then. Jeff Gorman from Indians101.com with us here every Tuesday talking tribe, and it's going to get a lot more uh, – frequency and interesting and topics and a lot of things to talk about now because the winter for us my friend officially over we move into spring training mode next week i love it i can't wait and then before it's move on it'll be time to start the games for real that's really when it's really going to get to be a lot of fun that's it man that is it we talked about it yesterday we're within a couple weeks of the first spring training game and two months to the day uh was it friday when jonathan knight was on with us so we're under two months now for opening day. Cannot wait. Jeff Gorman, have a good one. Enjoy your week. You and I will talk. We'll do some Browns talk. on. Uh, <laughs> look ahead to that. Do some Browns talk <laughs> on Friday. Hey, I'm just saying. Maybe by then I'll be in the mood. I've already got to talk with Dr. Football here in a moment. But we're going to talk about other stuff. And, you know, Hopefully just brush around those guys. But I don't care. Don't bring me down just yet. I've got one more commercial break before I've got to talk football. Talking some baseball with Jeff Gorman here like ELO. Don't bring me down. But uh, we'll do it again Friday. We'll do the Browns thing, you and I, next week. We start spring training, baby. All right. Sounds good, Derek. You have a good week, man. You got it. Hey, anything good cooking this week on Indians101.com? Um, probably going to talk a little bit about uh, some of these some of these guys who are still out there without a job and see if any of them could possibly fit in with the Indians. 
Sounds good. Some free agent talk. Check it out. Jeff Gorman, Indians101.com. And check him out here every Tuesday, Talking Tribe. And on Fridays, Talking Browns. We'll see you Friday, my friend. Have a great week. You too. Thanks, man. You got it. Jeff Gorman, Indians101.com. Every Tuesday right here in the house. This is the last Tuesday. without. Yeah, It's, just, it's on next week. It's spring training week. It, that's it. The winter is officially over. I don't care what it says outside my window. If you want to argue with somebody when they say you're crazy, say J Rock said winter's over. If you got a problem, take it up with him. We're gonna take a break, get you some news when we come back. That that and fifty well no, fifty cents doesn't get you a cup of coffee anymore. That and a dollar fifty will get you a cup of coffee. That's about all that's worth. But anyways, we're gonna take a break, get you some news when we come back. Doctor Football, Bill Check is in the house. And that's a shame. You can't even say that and fifty cents will get you a cup of coffee. Everything's gone up in price. Everything inflates. We'll take a break, get you the news. Inflate, deflate. I can't believe I just made that joke. I wasn't even planning on it. We're talking some football, the inflated kind, with Dr. Football. When we come back, we'll talk T. Rich busting out in Indy, having just just more issues and more issues. And we'll talk about that, legal issues. Maybe we'll bring up the Browns and more. Dr. Football, Bill Checkis, joins us next after the news. The Sports Fix, your choice for intelligent talk. I'm expecting a very important delivery at the house, so could you please call me if it arrives? I'll give you my cell number. 401-555-1125. Four. 40440. Four no, no, I was just repeating the four. One four. One four. Uh, intelligent talk. Okay, one one two five. One one two five. One five five. I'm not giving you quantities of the numbers. I'm giving you the numbers. One one two five. Those are the last four numbers. Oh, I see. One one two five. Yes. All right. Now read the number back to me. Let me get my pen. The sports fix will be right back. I'm Tyler Zeller, and you're listening to the Sports Fix. Today on Save on Taxes, we ask 100 people what costs less than filing your taxes with IRS Free File. A car seat. Ooh, a pair of shoes. The correct answer is nothing. When you use Free File, you get brand name software, tax prep, e-filing, and help with the new health care provisions all for free. So did we win anything? Everybody wins. Freefile.irs.gov. It's fast. It's safe. It's free. Business owners and professionals, do you want to take your business, your product, your team, your event to the next level? You want to advertise right here with the Sports Fix. Our listeners are among the most loyal listeners, terrestrial or internet. The Sports Fix universe is not only the radio show, but tens of thousands of fans on Facebook and Twitter. Email me, Jerry Myers, the Sports Fix at AOL.com. That's the Sports Fix at AOL.com. And let me help you swing for the fences and hit it out of the park right here on the Sports Fix. Whether it's an oil change or a new set of tires, Quick Lane at Valley Ford Truck has you covered for your car care needs. They're your neighborhood quick service experts. They also offer a low price tire guarantee. Choose from 13 brands, and if you find the same tires at a lower price within 30 days, Quick Lane at Valley Ford will refund the difference. 5715 Canal Road, right under the 480 Bridge in Valley View. Come see why life is better in the Quick Lane. Quicklane.com slash Valley Ford Truck. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Harry Buffalo. Harry Buffalo, join the herd. News break. Good morning, I'm Bob Picozzi. He becomes the ninth NBA coach to do it, but Greg Popovich is the only one of the nine to do it with a winning record against every opponent he has faced. Number 1,000 came in San Antonio's 95-93 victory last night in Indiana. I don't do too much celebrating, you know. Oh, yeah. So, you know, I've been here a long time and I've had good players. You know, that's the formula. And Popovich has 322 more wins than any other active NBA coach. Ten of the 23 teams Kentucky has faced this year shot less than 30% against the Wildcats. 
Number one ranked Kentucky puts its 23-0 record on the line tonight at LSU, 7 o'clock Eastern time on ESPN. Former UNLV basketball coach Jerry Tarkanian is resting comfortably in intensive care this morning. After being unresponsive yesterday morning, he has been dealing with heart-related issues for several years. Detroit Tigers DH Victor Martinez undergoes surgery today to repair a torn meniscus. The team has not said how long he's expected to be sidelined. Martinez finished second in the voting for the American League MVP award last season. Sports Center on ESPN Radio is brought to you by H&R Block. It's refund season. Come into Block and get your billions back, America. Call 1-800-HR-BLOCK or visit hrblock.com to make an appointment. You're listening to The Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix Live Hour 2 here across the Sports Fix Radio Network. Roaring on like a lion. Roar, baby, as we... uh, Katy Perry-ish here as we roar. I'm just kidding. I don't even know where that came from, man. But uh, Welcome back. J-Rock with you here. Hour 2 of the show. Dr. Football getting ready to join us. We're going to talk some NFL here and... uh, off seasons begun there, and uh, I bet they're loving the way the off seasons begun. They get to high point more people than ever watch your Super Bowl, and then you get these clowns, and it's a clown show, man. They're they, the little clowns. Are, it's like when they get out of the car and they all can't run fast enough, and they're like acting like they're dizzy, and they're yeah, well, except they're not acting. Uh, these guys. How about the? Well, we'll talk about it with Doctor Football in a minute, but Joseph Randall, we talked about. Uh, that guy, that idiot, I don't care. You tell me not to rush to judgment all you want. He was an idiot when he stole drawers and cologne, and he's a, a professional. And a, he was an idiot if he stole it and he worked at Drug Mart, let alone the fact that he stole the underwear and cologne and he works in the NFL. But now, uh, the latest story, man, no time for that stuff. But you know what? Hey, maybe he lives, I don't know the legal rules down there in, in Texas. Maybe he... He lives in a, in a in a place where he can get found guilty and then say, I want a second trial, and then he can buy his way out of it. Worked out really, really well for Mr. Hardy down in the uh, Carolinas. So let's talk about all of that. T. Rich having some, yeah, he's having some trouble over there in Indy and more. Dr. Football, Bill Checkus, going to join us here on the Sports Fix. You guys, he's on the hotline, so you can't be on the hotline, but you can keep it rolling on Facebook and Twitter. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Tweet with us at the Sports Fix, C L E, and email us the Sports Fix at AOL.com. Go into the phones. The doctor, he's in the house. House call underway. Dr. Football, Bill Checkers. Bill, how you doing this afternoon? What's up, J Rock? How you doing? I'm good. How are you? Um, sitting in the middle of an office that looks like a hurricane hit it, uh, but outside of that, not too bad. There we go, man. I'm sitting inside an office that looks like a hurricane hit it too. I'm just too lazy to straighten it up today, so it is what it is, man. Guess what? <laughs> Nobody else is coming to work to complain about it today. So, That's right. how you doing, my man? How you, how you feeling? I'm, I'm doing okay. How about you, man? Fantastic. Absolutely. A little bit under the weather here today, as I said, but, uh, um, that's why the uh, little extra bumper music before I come in from the breaks, making sure I got everything all cleared out. But uh, it is what it is. Tonight should be fun because uh, I've got to do a, I've got a game. I'm a radio broadcast tonight, which is awesome. Love doing it. But um, by the time I reach 7:15 tonight to go on the air, I should sound like uh, you know I'm gargling razor blades over here. So I'm gonna do the best I can to do the old honey and lemon juice and all the old broadcasting tricks and try to uh, try to do the thing. But you know what? Who wants to hear all that, man? So I'm just gonna say I'm doing fine, Doctor Football. I'm doing fine. I, I, you know, I figured it's okay because uh, it, it's all right these days to sound like uh, John Kate. From Steppenwolf, like you goggle with crushed glass. 
Hey, you know, they call it the voice. Hey, it's like like John Facenda, the voice of God. You know, hey, there's a perfect place to start right there. Um, you know, and obviously not anything earth shattering when a 92 year old gentleman passes away. But with uh, the passing of Ed Sable, and of course he was in one of those. You never like it in in life the situation where the father out uh, outlasts the son, and of course we know. Uh, his son passed away of cancer, just, you know, recently. But the NFL films people in general, Ed Sable, Steve Sable. I mean, NFL films, when you a lot of times people use terms like visionary or uh, revolutionizing this and that. That's the actual definition. I was wrong. Ed Sable was 98, not 92. So there you that's a lifetime right there. Lord, please let me live 100 years, man. That's a that's a that's a lifetime right there, man. But NFL films changed and really created the base, the model and an awesome model for what all future hype highlight uh, season review videos, all of that stuff. It was the forebearer to the the modern highlight reels that we see today. It all started with the awesomeness of those early NFL films. You know, I can remember going back as far as I could remember. Uh, you know, when I was a young, young lad into the mid '60s, uh, when NFL films uh, first was getting uh, its legs under it. And I can remember watching on Saturday evenings, you know, this NFL Films Presents, This is the NFL, on WOR-TV Channel 9 in New York City. And uh, let me tell you something, J-Rock. Uh, that was like uh, better than American Bandstand. You were glued to the TV every Saturday evening. Oh, let me tell you, I'm right there with you. Uh, number one, the the blooper reels, because I mean they they did all kinds of stuff that that were was never done before. I I remember getting the, those were so cool. This is the era where you didn't go to uh, you know Family Dollar and there's 800 DVDs available for a dollar a piece and all the no. I mean you, you'd come across those occasional NFL films blooper videos. Those were like. The, the coolest, my favorite things to watch when I was a, a, a little boy, man. The, you know, you'd have that NFL Films music in the background, and then it would be the the Fumble Rooski reel, where it's the ball just slipping all over the field, and all of the, you know, the, the snaps in slow motion that go over the guy's head, and you see the look in his face as he follows the ball. Those were awesome. And now... That, like I said, that's what we get every day. Like, if a guy makes a blunder, you're going to see it 50 times by 7 o'clock, you know. But back then, they created that. And there's so many things that they did, not just in the films. Those, like you said, this is the NFL. I remember I used to love finding those randomly on television from time to time when you'd flip through. Or when you'd make your subscription to Sports Illustrated and you'd get a an NFL Films video that came as part of your uh, sign-up. Or sometimes you got the football phone. Sometimes you got your team's highlight video. And you would watch like the Browns highlights but set to... And it looked so different when you got those line shots of the offensive linemen breathing smoke. And you, you, you would see the game. I love to this day... I hate the drive and the fumble, but I could watch those NFL films versions of those games. Uh, they're awesome. I mean, because they, they are able to capture what a game, the story, the emotion, those excellent different camera angles and all the things that you don't see. I mean, they really did revolutionize it for everything. And they added the mics on the players and they added all the the slow replays. Like I said, the blooper reels, uh, different camera angles from the reverse end zones, all of that stuff all came from the minds of the Sables. Yeah, and... Um... You know what they did for uh, what they did for us in the business, uh, being able to uh, uh, catalog and rewatch these historic moments that we've seen uh, the past many many years. Uh, you know, you just can't. There's no, nothing that comes close to it. it it's, no. it's just uh, what they did was, was simply nothing short of amazing. And I mean, think about it. All of that, all this that we're talking about started with talk. This is where being a visionary comes from. They put up the rights for the 1962 NFL championship. Ed Sable said, I'll pay, I'll, I'll do it for $3,000 
and he won the bid to get the rights to film this game. And from that, that's it. Like literally history changed at that point right there. And like you said, man, there's nothing like I still remember growing up. Maybe it's one of the reasons that I fell so in love with the game of football outside of the fact that the Browns were very good during my childhood, which doesn't hurt either. But when you watch a guy as a kid and then again, maybe now. Not as much because you see so much hype. Everything, the regular commercials are filmed with such production values now that it, it's a whole different experience just to watch television. But man, to watch them and hear that voice talk about the frozen tundra and you're watching these players steaming and, and, and the way they could make it so romantic to talk about the, you know, the you know the violent uh, shuddering of the tackle and the all of that the speed of the, oh man just the the way they frame the game that really did it, as in my childhood those NFL films went a long way towards the reason that I fell in love with the NFL. Yeah, and uh, for anybody that has uh, the NFL Network, I suggest uh, uh, as they replay the uh, episode of a Football Life uh, with Ed Sable. Steve Sable on it this week that you uh, tune in and watch it. Uh, I've, I've seen it a bunch of times, so I don't need to uh, press record on the DVR, but uh, it's something I highly suggest. If you really want to learn about the inside of, uh, you know, putting together uh, a production of football broadcast, uh, this, is the, this is the show you want to watch. For sure. And I'll tell you what, NFL is glad that we're, we've got something like this to talk about because we stood, could have started the conversation talking about all that. Man, I'll tell you what, what a, what a way to start the offseason for the league in general, my friend. As you're listening to the Sports Fix, Dr. Football, J-Rock here doing the thing. Uh, you come off a record high attendance and viewership for the, uh, for the Super Bowl. And then it's been nothing but one pothole after another here in the week and a half since for the NFL early on uh, one player after another talked about, um, Oh, all of a sudden his name slipped me. The, 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 the line, the defensive tackle for the Packers that was just caught last week with uh 500, 600 grams of pot, like 10, 12 pounds of pot and almost 200 grand in cash. And uh, how about, how about uh, Joseph Randall, by the way, uh, earlier in the season, Stupid. I don't care. There's no other word for it. Gets caught with the underwear and the cologne. And then he, he gets caught in the uh, fingerprint room, dogging on, bringing up his teammates, and they're getting off of arrests and different things and, and, and putting them on there. It didn't do him any good anywhere. Uh, but now here, another situation with him over the weekend uh, in a situation with his girlfriend or fiance, whatever she is. Uh, guns involved, drugs involved, children, infant children involved. Nine one one, another one of these instances, man. I mean, the NFL since the season ended, they've been hit. One, not that hey, the, I feel bad for them, but they've been hit with one thing after another on top of all of the uh, investigations that they've got going on. They got four different active ones for various things against teams, but apparently some of these guys didn't get the point and didn't get the picture this season that the NFL is in trouble in the public relations world. Therefore, they're going to take it out on somebody here because clearly some of these guys here in the last 10 days that we're mentioning now are going to have to feel the heavy hammer to make up for the lack of one earlier last season with Ray Rice and with Adrian Peterson. And so, you know, but it just amazes me, man, this, uh, it's going to have to. It's going to flesh itself out. You're not going to change anything overnight, but, you know, the continued hand-in-hand hand NFL and the words domestic violence is something they obviously are not happy about at this point. You know, and in the meantime, uh, Goodell puts together a committee uh, to examine the opportunities uh, in L.A. for a team and a stadium, and, uh, you know, they're not able to address this stuff which, if you ask me, uh, should take precedence over whether or not there's a team in Los Angeles. Oh, for sure. I, I Trust me, I'm with you. But all those things, just like I said, having people talking about footballs during the uh, – during the Super Bowl week was better than people asking you these uh, these questions about things like that. But uh, this guy here, to me, and, uh, you know, I get it. I get the whole innocent and the legal system and all that. But you can tell me that all you want, and I'll say it's a shield a lot of times that after the fact, guys hide behind. Let's talk about what happened 
down in North Carolina. Let's talk about Greg Hardy here for a second. I brought it up yesterday, and I'm just curious where you are. And by the way, the 911 calls are out there. Go take a listen to Joseph Randall and the, the, the calls that his girlfriend made uh, while she's there with his child there in the hotel room. But um, look at Hardy. We read some of the testimony. Guys know. I mean, that was some... If you actually go and look at the details in that case, the facts that both sides have presented, some ugly stuff in there. The guy's found guilty, but because of the type of legal system that they have down there, he's able to ask for that legal verdict to be tossed out for him to get a second trial in front of a judge. And uh, before that one can start, conveniently, the woman who was accusing him of everything has intentionally made herself unavailable for the trial because she's reached a financial settlement. And I matter of fact, don't quote me on this part, but I saw a local news person down there and I don't know if it's gone viral, but there may have been somebody may have actually literally caught her shopping while the, she was expected to be showing up for this thing. Or Anyways, point being, she told them she's not testifying. She's reached a civil settlement. She is not going to say anything. And so in all in, intents and purposes, like it or not, what I'm going to say Greg Hardy bought his way out of that, and now the NFL can say, hey, well, technically he wasn't found guilty of anything. I'm curious where – I don't think the NFL can get away with that, by the way. I think they're going to have to do something. But how do you, when this guy's legal team, which is what it's all about nowadays, can go, hey, this man was found innocent or was not, he wasn't found innocent, but he wasn't found guilty either. Yeah, and, uh, and and that's a cop out. We know it is. Uh, uh, we know that's what's going on. Uh, the, the quote unquote the fix is in, so to speak. Right. So, uh, you know. Go ahead. I, I, and what kills me, what kills me, Jerry, is that um, you know, again, people want to hold up professional athletes as role models. Uh, you know, I may be uh, in the media business, but uh, I'd sooner talk about guys who do good. You know, around uh, the league, guys who do good for charity than uh, guys like this. And I'll tell you though, you know that phrase. There's another one. As we, earlier, I said this about uh, salaries in baseball. Don't get me going on a topic I could do a whole show about. But uh, I'm in that. I don't care, Charles Barkley. I don't care what you say. I believe you can tell me it's not fair, but I believe intrinsically. You are a role model because of the place that you're in in society. You can tell me it's not fair. You can say parents need to teach their kids not to look up to athletes. I get it, and I do. I definitely teach my kids that, man. But it doesn't change the fact that they do. It doesn't change the fact that intrinsically you are. You are an example and a role model to kids, to young men and women and everybody. I mean... That can sound all oh, Jerry J Rock being all he look he thinks it's the the fifties and we're all no listen man that's the reality of the position you're in I say the same thing about entertainers and all of them too you can tell me you're not and I agree that you shouldn't be but you are because you're what they see on their TV you're what they strive to be in their real life when people say Miley Cyrus should be allowed to be the the dumbest whore in the world she can go out there and do whatever she wants because people buy albums I. I say you have a responsibility to millions of girls ages 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 who look up to you and go, I can be her because guess what? That means I can be a whore if you want to be true about it because look at what this woman is out here doing. And I'm not all fuddy-duddy. Listen, I'm all about entertainment and, and I get it and I'm not I'm not looking for, you know, sitcoms to have husband and wife sleeping in separate beds. Any, that's not where I'm going. But... You have, yes, Charles and Larry in the chat room, I did call Miley Cyrus a whore. I believe she's a, a disgusting individual because of the position she's in. She may not have asked to be a role model to children, but when you create your fame on a children's television show, unfortunately, you have to become a role model to young children. That's not, you may not have asked for it, but it's the price of fame. Charles Barkley may not have asked to be a role model, but it's the price of being the star power forward for the Philadelphia 76ers or whatever. So that drives me crazy. Because I agree that you didn't ask to be a role model, and I agree that parents should tell their kids not to look up to you. But it doesn't matter what I tell my son. Now, he can believe 
that his dad's uh, telling him the truth and all that. But it, I'll tell you what. If Drake says it, if Justin, well, my kid doesn't like Justin Bieber, but if Justin Bieber says it, or Miley Cyrus, if that's your thing, or LeBron James, or Johnny Manziel, or whatever, it, guess what? Kids all over think it's cool to spend every waking hour partying if you become famous like Johnny Manziel. They think it's cool. It's what you're allowed to do. You know why? Because they hear people continue to say, well, he's allowed. He's perfectly allowed. He's a grown-up. He's allowed to go out there and party every night. That's cool. And that's why teenage kids go, man, I can't wait to be Johnny Football. I could spend every night on inflatable swans with, you know, half-naked strippers hanging out in Vegas, you know, and that's cool. And you can also end up doing a lot of the bad things that end up there, too. And I'm just saying, point being is Johnny Manziel may not want to be kids' example, but you are. So deal with it or go work at Walmart. So anyways, I could keep going about that. But whenever you say role model and athletes, I go, listen, you didn't ask for it. I understand. I totally understand that. Doesn't matter. Comes with the territory. That's right. It's not thrust on you. So you, you have to behave in a certain way, whether you like it or not. And uh, obviously that's something that uh, young Mr. Manziel hasn't uh, uh, learned quite just yet. Well, I wasn't even in any way. I just, he's a local example. That's the only reason I brought him up. I'm just saying, I'm talking about this guy here specifically, you know? And uh, I say it all the time when people say, well, the guy just plays football. He's not meant to be this, that, and the other thing. Well, then maybe he's not meant to play football either because I still believe that it's a privilege and not a right. But some goof will stand up in front of me right now and say, that's all he's meant to do is play football. And I say, well, that's a sad existence if you believe that you were put on this earth just to go run around with a football. If you truly believe that that's your worth in this world, then you live a sad existence. And when you're not able to play football anymore, what are you going to do? What's your contribution to the world? Since that's the only job that you're worth. Here, I'm just going off on a rant. But if that's because I love when these when these agents, Bill, they go, well, he has to make a living. He has, You can't deny this man a way to make a living. What is he going to do in the four, five years max that his NFL career is over? What What is he going to do then since the only thing he's capable of doing is playing football? Exactly. Yeah, and that's the problem. Uh, you know, as we've talked about in the past, eighty percent of these guys, by the time they've played five years, um, you know, uh, they, um, you know, they just walk away from it. I'll tell you what, man. I mean, seriously. You know what the difference is? When Joseph Randall's not in the NFL, maybe he shoots his girlfriend because he doesn't have to protect his career instead of just taking it almost to that point and then convincing himself that he has to protect his career. That's what happens. That's what happens when their four to five years is up. They become a story of the former football player who this right. time went too far and killed somebody or went too far and did this, did that, did the other thing. So... Whatever, but you 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 hit the trigger word, Bill. You said role model. I said, wait a minute, let me get going. And you know what? You could rightfully go, whose role model is Joseph Randall? I could give you that because who is Joseph Randall? A backup running back for the Dallas Cowboys, right? But there's some kid, maybe in the hometown where Joseph Randall came from, in Wichita, where he's from, maybe in 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 whatever college day, somebody may look up to him. And may go, hey man, cool. I can't wait to be like him too, man. And then, yeah, I'm just saying, you never know, you know. And that's that's the intrinsic responsibility that comes with it. The minute you put on a jersey, collect a paycheck, and if you don't like it, that's cool, man. Like I say, welcome to Walmart. How can I help you? Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, man. Oh, I'm just saying. You There's know, jobs and, available, and brother. It's it's funny because I met a guy a number of years ago when I was still teaching back east, um, and he was a pretty big guy. He was about six, six or six seven, and um, he was a school safety officer, uh, you know, a school policeman at one of the schools I was teaching at. So we had started a football team, and he had come to me and said, "You know, I'd like to volunteer my time, you know, at the school as to help you out as an assistant coach." And um, when I found out that he had played for, uh, you know, the University of Miami and briefly had played in the NFL, I said, how'd you wind up here? And he said, I didn't pay attention. You know, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And I found myself out of football with a college degree and no job. Yeah. 
You know, I mean, again, I'm, I know there's some people <laughs> going, well, uh, this, that and the other thing. I'll leave it be. Yeah, you guys know where I'm at on that. I, I shouldn't have went off on that rant, I guess. But that's what I do here. So occasionally I get fired up. That's one of them. More, I think that's one of my biggest hot button ones right there is when people start getting me. And you know what, though? I was never that guy before. You talk about perspective. My my buddy, Raymond Rowe, he's a, a wrestler for Ring of Honor, uh, travels the country performing and kicking some tail, representing Cleveland. But he, he put up a quote on Facebook. He's one of those perspective guys. He always uh, has the deep quote of the day. You, you go, man, that was deep when you look at his stuff that he puts up. And he said, you know, proper perspective is everything, and it really changes everything. And, and it's so true because... You to get you get me at the beginning of my adult years. Uh, I'm an, I don't you know, no, they're no role models. Ah, oh, they're just there to play football and basketball and and go be a better parent. But now, as spending all these years, I've had children for 16 years now. So I started early, learned a lot of young lessons. But point being, one of the biggest ones I learned was no matter how hands-on I am, no matter how, and, and I am, I think I, I think that I've got a really good relationship, especially with, with both of my kids. But the older one now, it's much more transitioning, less of a I'm your dad and you do what I tell you to do, and much more of a I make my own decision, so I have to treat you like a, a person, not, not like a person. That's that probably sounded wrong, but you know what I mean. I have to now deal with you on much more of an adult level than before when it was because I'm your dad and I told you to. So we have deeper conversations, and I know where he's coming from. But at the end of the day, I watch his just his slang, and I watch his likes and dislikes influenced by athletes, by entertainers, by social media, what these guys post and like, and and you can see it. So it doesn't matter how strongly you raise your kids the right way. There's still going to be that influence. And a lot of it comes from the athletes and the entertainers. But you can't tell some guys that because then they'd have to be responsible for their own behavior. And we can't have that. We cannot have personal responsibility, can we? No, no. Yeah, and that's that's really the thing that um, a lot of the uh... – NFL team security details are looking at now when they do their research. Uh, in fact, looking at NFL.com right now, there's a big article on uh, players like uh, Jameis Winston, for example, who are red flags as prospects this year uh, because of character concerns. Man, I'll tell you what. Uh, Dr. Football, J-Rock talking about some of this. And, and go back to Dr. Football. I don't know if you read, but to start, go back to where we started this. Go read the transcripts of the 911 calls, you know? I mean, this this idiot, Randall, he's in a hotel room with his kid and his woman. And he's pointing guns and he's uh, whatever. Anyways, stupid. We'll move on from that. Uh, you know what, though? Just all over. Like I said, you get the guy from the Packers last week. Caught, I mean, it was Nate Newton-ish. You know, remember Nate Newton? I'll never yes. forget. Uh, how do you get caught twice doing the same thing? I mean, I get it. You got yourself in money issue, whatever, but that's crazy. Here, this cat last week, and he's whining at the cops, don't take my money. Well, if you were really worried about that 190000 number one, maybe you should have had it in a bank somewhere instead of wrapped up in a garbage bag surrounded by 12 pounds of pot. At that point, you kind of put your money up for grabs there. I think it was kind of all of a sudden it was a jump ball who was going to get that money now. So, But uh, where? what in the world are these? cats thinking when you have the opportunity and maybe that's why i i draw the lines that i do i believe in second chances but when you have that certain opportunity to do something and better yourself in a way that the 99 percent of the population can never do and then you still don't appreciate it i've got no time for you you know yeah, and you know, it's funny because, uh, again, we had an incident uh, the other day with Warren Sapp, who was supposed to be over all this as, a, as, a, oh, as an yeah. NFL Hall of Famer and as an NFL Network commentator. And now, not only uh, was he arrested, but he's out of a job. Well, absolutely. You know what, though? I'll bet you this past season, 
and I don't have the footage, but I bet you we could go back. If you DVR'd every moment of NFL Network over the last six months, how many times this year did Warren Sapp probably sit there and wag his finger at Ray Rice or or Adrian Peterson or even Roger Goodell, and then he goes to the Super Bowl and pulls that garbage that he does, you know? I mean, I have no, I don't feel bad for that, you know? Number one, that's not a second chance. You've had some other issues before, but there you go, man. Again, just what... What, and then the best part, too, is the NFL warned them all. They, The Players Association warned every player that Arizona was going on a prostitution crackdown for the Super Bowl because they know that players have been busted over the years over and over and over, former players, current players. As we know, we've seen guys suspended from the game because they picked up a hooker over Super Bowl weekend. NFL PA warned everybody. This goof is out there still. Hey, whatever. You do what you do, and you paid the price. You lost your job. Nobody can argue. You can't say, well, what's he going to do now? He's going to figure out what to do when the rest of us lose our job because we did something wrong. You go find another one because you no longer can do that anymore. Move on. Same thing here with those guys, man. So we don't need to keep beating the dead horse into the ground there. But uh, I'll tell you what. One other thing I wanted to touch on with you. I'm intentionally avoiding the Browns. I'm not going to lie. We've been talking about that mess enough right now. But kind of a segue off the Browns. That trade looking better. And I mean, it was it, it couldn't have looked any better. You'd have thought that the Browns were able to flip Trent Richardson for a first round draft pick to the Colts. But, man, it just continues to, much like here, like after the season, you know, the dirty laundry comes out, just like we saw with the Browns here. Now you're starting to hear all of the uh, the stories of how bad things got for him at the end of the season. And I wondered, like uh, you and I talked about the week of the championship game when he said, well, you can bet you'll never see that situation happen again. That wasn't him and the team on the same page. That was him warning the team that you better not bench me again. And he wasn't happy with it. But uh, as we see, they had issues with him not uh, practicing right. His weight, he put on 20 pounds, they say, during the season. Um all kinds of issues. We know he couldn't beat out Bradshaw and he ended up not playing in the playoffs and boom, Heron was taking his snaps and uh, there were even undrafted guys taking his snaps by the end before he was inactive. He still owes the Colts a game suspension going into next season. But uh, a lot of people got it wrong with Trent Richardson. I was never a big Richardson guy coming. I just, his, I, his style, whatever. But, uh, of course, the Browns drafted him because that's what they do. Most of the time, whenever I say I'm not a big fan of this guy, he's usually right at the top of the Browns list. But, anyways, how did everybody get it so wrong with Trent Richardson? And do you think a lot of these problems here are his own inability to deal with how his career has gone so far? You know, I do. I think that a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, his personal makeup. Uh, he hasn't, uh, you know, he hasn't shown me uh, anything off the field. It's important to be able to show things on the field, but he hasn't shown me any, any kind of leadership off the field either. I mean, what what do you think? Ha- I mean, really, did everybody just get it wrong from the physical tools as well? Because... It's literally been all downhill from the moment he hit the NFL. I mean, I mean, really, and that's a big part of it, too. I mean, a lot of what made him stand out in college, it made him run of the mill, in my opinion. Um, You know, I mean, but a lot of people thought perhaps, and I was curious, I'm not going to lie, when the Colts traded for him, I said, okay, let's go see when he goes to a, a good environment and a team that's built for the playoffs and this is a contender and they've got a pretty stable head coach and they've got a good situation. I'm curious, will Trent Richardson, maybe not blossom, but will he do better than he did in Cleveland? And it's gone even more downhill. And I wonder if maybe he didn't feel the same way. Maybe he said, Hey, a lot of what went wrong. That wasn't me. That was Cleveland. I'm going to go get a fresh start. And then he realized that those same problems carried over because it wasn't just Cleveland's problem. It was you. And these are issues with you, whether it's conditioning, whether you just don't have that next level speed, whatever it may be. Uh, I think that is what got him because I think he felt the same way, like I said, a lot of uh, media did was, all right, blame it on Cleveland. Trent Richardson will go have a chance to shine now. And then when it didn't happen for him, he started to go, what what is going on? And and, and then obviously got in his own head here. But uh, uh, buyer beware for sure. And I guarantee you he is in 
draft lore as the legacy of the last running back that will ever be taken that high in an NFL draft again. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot more to that than, than meets the eye. Uh, as uh, teams' profits shrink, uh, teams come into the draft thinking that they're not going to go out and draft uh, a skill position player. Uh, it's been said to me uh, before, I didn't really believe it the first time it was said to me, but then I went back and I examined drafts over the past several years, and I noticed that as uh, NFL teams' profits outside of ticket sales got, got smaller, uh, direct picks went away from the skill players and they went towards London. Oh, yeah. I mean, we can talk. Well, we've talked about the trends of that anyway. I mean, you've seen it. I mean, the Browns were crazy that year, period, because even by then, the jig was up on going up that high to take running backs as it is. Everybody started to figure out, hey, wait a minute. There's examples all over the league of third round, fourth round, fifth round, undrafted running backs who uh, get the opportunity and go out there and shine. I mean, uh, so, but I mean, I remember that because I remember doing a, a broadcast live the night that uh, T. Rich, oh, that infamous T. The T. Rich and Brandon Wheaton draft. I'm telling you, that one's got to go down in history as definitely worse than Farmer's first draft because while Farmer may have got the first round screwed up, and and the jig is is not up on that. By the way, there's only one season. You can't exactly judge a draft class after one season and to me it takes three seasons at least before you can really start to judge it but the early results on the rest of his draft is pretty good so you know but man you can't say that about the Richardson and Whedon draft you just go man really that's that's what we took out of this thing but uh, I remember watching it but for sure I mean that was the yeah LG you and I were broadcasting live that night my friend and uh, LG in the chat room just reminded me of that but I thought it was a surprise right. that they did it then That's right. you'll never uh, yeah we were on the phone with you that night you were in the uh, right. you were in New York at the draft I That's remember right. that I was in and, the I was in the yeah. I was uh, I was in the hotel room talking to you uh, that night yes after the draft. yes and, you were uh, the one that told know, us had... about thirty seconds before it aired that they were drafting Richardson we're like what. What trading yes. up and then when they yep. made the trade up, that's what got us because you don't take a, a running back there anyway, let alone trade up another pick to get him. When they made that trade up, I was that's what shocked me the most that they took Richardson because they didn't just get him, but they went up to get him like Minnesota was taken. Like you needed to trade up, you could have traded back ten picks and still got Trent Richardson in that draft. You could have traded back into the second round and probably still got him. Although. In hindsight, the Browns felt they had to do what they had to do, and at least Joe Banner got that draft pick right uh, back for him. So at least they got a second chance at it, and of course they drafted Johnny Manziel with the second pick. So, I mean, whatever. Did you really upgrade? I don't know. Uh, hey, I just remember that night, Dr. Football, and what do you think? We're wrapping it up. Trent Richardson, does he do anything ever again in the NFL, or is the jig up for Trent Richardson? You know, I think that's it. I think he may have a, a better career at this point, um, either in the CFL or the AFL. Uh, you know, he, he, it's a shorter season or uh, a game, you know, a game like the indoor game with more offense or, um, you know, I don't know, a longer field. I don't know what else we could do for this guy, but there has to be something. We can't create a league just for him. He's a pass-catching running back, like you said, maybe the AFL. Hey, Gladiators, I got an idea. I bet you the Indians have a couple dozen, before they ship them off to a, a third-world country like they do with the, the old T-shirts, get a few of those unfinished business T-shirts, right? Put a Gladiators logo on the back of it. Ship a couple dozen over to Trent Richardson. I'm telling you, man, you may be able to convince him of a, a worth one. No, I'm just kidding. Hey, you know what? There you go. There's a, what's his name? Uh, Gene Simmons. You want to go sell some tickets? You could put the LA kiss in the LA Coliseum. If you get Manziel as your quarterback and get uh, T rich to come in, that will be the most high powered, uh, or at least the most star powered arena football team in history. Just having some fun, man. I'm not you, you know, and I, I, I would have, if that was the case, I would go work for the LA kiss. And, and I'm just Gene, saying Gene and Paul's football guy. I want to work know, for the LA Kiss, they're from brother. New York, they know nothing about football. I don't care about the football. They they want they just want to sell tickets. And I I want to work for I want to work for Gene Simmons because that is so ridiculous. I watched that show 
I, I couldn't get enough of it. I didn't find it right away. When I did, the season was over. I don't care. I binge watched that whole season. It was such bad TV that it was good. Watching Gene, Gene and Paul try to run a football team and they're having their meetings and rubbing his chin as he's trying to figure out why they're not winning games. It's great. It's great watching the gears turn and they're trying to tell. I don't care if it's arena football. Those are still professional, have spent their life coaching, playing, whatever. They're still professional football players at a semi-pro level. Uh, That's still a higher level than Gene and Paul. But, man, they're out there talking to these guys like they just got off the banana boat, Dr. Football. I don't know if you've seen, what what was it, fourth and long, whatever they called that, fourth and loud, whatever, whatever they called that series. But uh, they're just, they're dogging these guys. Like, these cats just got off the banana boat and found out they had a football team to coach. I love it. It was great, man. It just, I loved it, man. They're undermining the quarterback and making players deals behind the coach's back coach spent the whole season knowing that they didn't even want him and it was great listening to well i don't even know if i'm gonna have a job next week because these guys really weren't happy to keep me to begin with and then they brought in a they had the offensive coordinator they brought in a quarterback who called his own plays and just started ignoring the head coach it was great man it was the most dysfunctional football this side of the Cuyahoga river i will tell you that (laughs) <laughs> I'm just being honest. Oh, my so, goodness. And you got to go look it up, man. Get Netflix. Go look up Fourth and Loud or whatever. Uh, it just It's terrible. If you just want to watch a train wreck, it's funny. And I could tell, I'm telling you, man, it, it doesn't work out in the NFL for Johnny Manziel. They, that, that's his spot. Go there and be famous, young man. But anyways. All right, Dr. Football. Hey, we got through this whole thing without uh, with only one or two. Uh, sarcastic references to the Cleveland Browns, so I'm pretty happy with that. And look, they've given me a headache. They've given Cleveland a headache. They've really kicked everybody in the gut with all, and, and I just we can't do it today. So I thought it was a good job. Thanks to you that we made it 40 <laughs> minutes and 11 seconds, 12 seconds, 13 seconds now without having to dive down that uh, that foxhole for sure. Well, I'll give you this, Shay Rock. Uh, as got? bad as things could be. Uh, it could never be as don't bad as it. it is in Oakland. Okay. Well, I don't know because I don't know. It felt like feels like we may be trying to to invest some of that Oakland tradition. Hey, you know, I mean, the deep football tradition of the Oakland Raiders. You know, I think we're trying to. You know what I? You know, I believe in bringing in those, bring in the lifeblood from winning organizations. So you know, there we go, man. Anyway, see, you just made it worse. Why'd you have to remind... Doctor, I'm going to hang up on you, man. Don't don't make it worse. We were doing good. We were doing fantastic, Bill. Hey, let's end it there. Just having fun. Good conversation. Looking forward to doing it again next Tuesday. You got it, J-Rock. And let me tell you this. Uh, like this. I said, it could never be as bad as it is in Oakland. So uh, at least the one thing is, in Cleveland, you've got a fan base that cares. That's what I said earlier. Apathy, that's when you have trouble. When the fan base doesn't care, it's over. Pack up the trucks, move it out of town. When the fan base doesn't care, there's nothing you can do to fix it at at that point. Dr. Football, have a good one. We'll catch up on Tuesday. All right, man. You be good. Have a good week. You got it. You too. That is my man, Bill Chekis, Dr. Football. He has 30 years of draft, Nick. That's, by the way, the name of the book that he's working on about his 30 years covering the NFL draft. And looking forward to start talking some draft with him as the uh, month of February moves on. We'll start looking ahead to, uh, of course, doing that whole thing. But at least now it's the right time of year to do it. At least we're not them cats that started doing it six months ago. So. Yeah, it is what it is. Let's take a break. Final break. Come on back. Set the stage for tomorrow. I'm doing some hooping up tonight. We'll talk about that. Uh, eh, A little something about the uh, Vikings that I said the other day. I'm going to put it out on the air. Monsters play tonight. We'll set the stage. Call it a day. Get you ready for tomorrow. Don't go anywhere. Final segment of The Fix coming up next. When it comes to Cleveland sports, we go from I can't touch this to I can't watch this. So listen to the fix. It's easier on the eyes. 
Guys, want to take just a second as we head into this break and remind you about the official business printing source of the Sports Fix, our friends at Signs and Ship. Signs and Ship, I'm telling you, Chris and Pam, they've taken care of me since day one, and they can do the same for you. Whether you're a small business that's already been established and you're looking to grow to that next level and expand your business, or perhaps you've got an idea that you just know is going to be a great business and you need to figure out how to brand it and how to promote it and put it out there, Signs and Ship is the place for you. If you need a logo, they can create one for you. They have a fantastic graphic designer. Business cards, signs, banners, yard signs, mobile advertising, anything you can think of that you need to promote your business, they've got it at Signs and Ship. The best thing about them, too, is each of their locations, whether it's the the home base here in Elyria, Ohio that I work with, or their spots in Virginia, Florida, and Pennsylvania. It's all local sourced. Very important to me because we all understand that small business is the lifeblood of the community. So check them out, signsandship.com, or call Chris and Pam today, 440-323-6060, the home office in Elyria, Ohio. Signs and Ship, quality printing at affordable prices. Portions of the Sports Fix brought to you by Fantasy Jocks. Looking to upgrade your league trophy? Check out FantasyJocks.com for championship belts, rings, trophies, and more. Fantasy sports lovers, you put so much time, hard work, and effort into playing week to week that it quickly stops being a fantasy and, and starts start getting, getting real. real. Real time spent making real decisions, creating real victory. I'm the greatest man in the world! And when the smoke clears, you want to show off those victories with a real prize. <laughs> I mean, a really real prize. Yeah. Nobody, Nobody does, does that, that like, like Fantasy, Fantasy Jocks. Jocks. The crew over at Fantasy Jocks have beautiful, high-quality, and heavy-duty championship belts, rings, trophies, and so much more for all your fantasy sports needs. The trophy's 12 feet high, and it is glorious! Football, baseball, hoops, you name it, they have it. Plus, they have awesome draft kits and party supplies to make all your preseason activities the envy of everyone. If your league needs a ring, belt, or trophy, or you want to upgrade what you already have, there's literally only one place to go. If you're going to be a fantasy jock, do it right. It's mine. The most magnificent belt ever created. And it's mine. With America's fantasy sports superstore, fantasyjocks.com. Sports Fix listeners, like us on Facebook today. Facebook.com slash the Sports Fix. Hey, everybody. Listen up. Listen up, guys. Hey, guys. Listen, listen up. up. No one should ever hit a woman. Not their wife, not their girlfriend, not their date. No woman should have to fear violence, especially not from someone they know and trust. But that's the reality for too many women. We have to change it. It's up to each of us, because even one is too many. Violence against women hurts all of us. Growing up, I was ashamed and afraid of my father when he abused my mom. The worst abuse of power is when a man raises his hand to hurt a woman. We all have to take responsibility. So if you see someone threatening a woman, step up, speak out, and get help. Dating violence hurts all of us. So step up and help end it. Because one is too many. One is too many. One is too many. One is too many. End the violence. Because it's wrong. Because one, one is too many. Hey, this is Antoine Jameson, and you listen to the Sports Fix. Welcome back to the Sports Fix final few minutes of the show. Thank you guys for being with us here. And uh, we may even, this may be, it's close. We're within three minutes, but we may clock in under the two hour mark here. And that's as close to a short show as I can get. I can't get any, I can't get any closer than that, man, as much as I try. I should have never even told you guys it was going to be a compact edition of the show. I knew that was the jinx the minute we got it. The curse of death right there. All right, welcome back. J-Rock with you here. Final segment of the Sports Fix. And uh, looking ahead real quick tonight, the Monsters back in action. Tomorrow, Doug Plagans, voice of the Lake Erie Monsters, he's going to join us here on the show. Monsters currently 11th in the conference. They have 49 points, finding themselves just three points outside of the final playoff spot. And they are just, they're within a handful of points of literally, within nine points of all of the bottom four playoff spots. So, Actually, of the bottom five, everything outside the top three. So, Monsters have their future in their hands here, and uh, 
it continues for them tonight. They've got a back-to-back coming up here. They've got Charlotte. Charlotte at the bottom of the conference. They're 14th in the conference here. They've got Charlotte today, and then they've got them again on Thursday. So in between, we'll get Doug Plagans here on the Sports Fix tomorrow. We'll look back at tonight's game. We'll look ahead to Thursdays. It's the first matchup this season for the Monsters and the Charlotte Checkers. 7 p.m. puck drop. Monsters, of course, dropped that game Cleveland uh, Cavaliers night the other night. 4 nothing. they lost to Hamilton. Charlotte lost their last game Saturday. They played Chicago, dropped 4-1 to one to the Wolves. Monsters are hot, 7-2, 2-0 over their last 11 games. Charlotte coming in cold. They've lost four straight, and they're 1-5, 1-0 over their last six games. Two teams split the four games last season, so we'll see what happens tonight. Ben Street had a five-game point streak snapped for the Monsters the other night. He had scored in three straight games before then. Let's see what the Monsters do. Meanwhile, Chad LaRose on the other side for the Checkers. He's played 508 National League, uh, National Hockey League games for the Carolina Hurricanes. Has 180 points up on that level. He'll be playing for the Checkers. Monsters, Checkers, first of two in three days tonight at the queue. Doug Plagans joins us tomorrow to break it all down. John McMullen from the Sports Network will be here tomorrow talking NFL. We'll talk all the latest with him. Pick up on some more of the stuff we were chatting with Dr. Football about today. Dan Wismar from the Cleveland Fan. He'll be here tomorrow. He uh, hit me up during the show actually this morning, but I had already saw this. Was going to talk to him about it here. We talked a lot on Monday show yesterday about Mike Weber and Stan Drayton leaving Ohio State and all of the brouhaha that was around, but uh, nothing comes better. I say this all the time than getting it directly from the horse's mouth. Mike Weber broke his silence yesterday on Twitter, congratulated uh, Stan Drayton for going to the NFL, talked about how excited he is, he is to have Tony Alford as the new <laughs> So I have no idea where that's coming from. Let's go ahead and shut that down there. Those auto plays will drive you crazy. Uh, and then he also uh, sent out a couple of other tweets about the situation and uh, other people being concerned for him because there was some talk about him wearing a Michigan shirt to uh, practice the other day when he was working out. And then all of a sudden people went to town on social media. So he answered that as well. He said, I apologize for simply wearing a t-shirt to work out in. I didn't make a statement. I didn't even know I was going on social media. So y'all can stop judging me now and talk about something else. So it appears to me that this uh, young man is happy with the decision that he made, even with the changes uh, and was probably more aware of, of what was going on during the process than some of the media would want to make it sound and make it sound like he just pulled a completely disingenuous move there. But we'll talk some more about that tomorrow. We'll talk some Buckeyes, hoops, and football, and talk about the Indians and the Browns and the Cavs. We'll do all the things we do on Wednesdays with Wismar when Dan Wismar joins us tomorrow on The Fix. All right, guys, speaking of joining me, do it tonight if you're into the whole basketball thing. It's a low Slow, low-hanging fruit here. Slow sports night tonight. So come on over to 1330 AM. Or if you live all the different places that you listen to the sports fix around the world, you can go on TuneIn, just like you listen to the show perhaps on TuneIn. Go to TuneIn and look for 1330 WINT. Or you can go directly to WINTradio.com. Either way, 1330 AM on your local radio dial. Search for 1330 WINT on TuneIn, or you can go directly to WINTradio.com. I've got a good one here tonight. We're in the home stretch. Most of these schools in Ohio have three, four, five games tops before playoffs start happening. West Geauga visits East Lake North. I'll be calling it. It's the game of the week on 1330 AM. So again, join me tonight. 1330 a.m. or wintradio.com tomorrow. Can't wait. Speaking of hoops, I'm going to wrap up with this. I said this on Twitter the other day, but I want to make sure that I formally, officially say it here on the air as uh, the Vikings had a couple days off here this week. I made the prediction Vikings not only going to make the uh, run through the regular season here, become I think they're going to finish it off with a regular season Horizon League, but I don't really care about that. They're going to win the tournament. They're going to host the tournament. Remember, top two seeds host the Horizon League tournament all the way through. I think Vikings are going to be the number one seed heading in. But no matter what the seeding is, Vikings are winning that tournament. Vikings are heading to March Madness. And I'm, you can put it on paper now. 
they're going to be that low seed that wins a game in the opening round. I don't I don't see a big crazy run, but I can definitely see a first round. Hey, I could even see perhaps slipping into the uh, into the second round there. But I'm going to tell you now, this Viking squad is built for March Madness. They can get hot behind the three. They can rebound, and they play Coach Waters' defense, man. And they're one of the hottest teams in, uh, in college basketball since they had their troubles at the start of the season. I'm telling you now, every year, five, six, seven, eight different mid-majors pull several upsets in March Madness this year. No doubt in my mind, Vikings can be one of those teams. It's not even anything uh, in my mind that's that big of a stretch. That big, Not hard at all to imagine. If you know what wins in March Madness, especially in those crazy early round games, and you look at the way the Vikings are comprised, you know where I'm coming from. The Vikings can scare the hell out of some of those big squads and easily, easily be one of those 11, 12, 10, 9, eh, no, nah, nah, not that high. Be one of those 11, 12 seeds that wins, hey, 12, 5 all the time. 12 over 5. The Vikings can be the latest 12 over 5 this year. 13, 4. One of those type upsets. We'll see. They've still got to handle some more business here down the stretch. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Monsters, Doug Plagans, John McMullins with us tomorrow. Dan Wismar and you. Let's do it. Sports Fix, same bad time, same bad channel. Live at noon tomorrow across the Sports Fix radio network. We love you, Cleveland and beyond. Join me tonight for some hoops on 1330 AM. Join me tomorrow at noon live right here for some more sports fix. We'll see you tomorrow. We love you. You know that I'm a tribes fan and I love sliming. Crockett Park's the perfect place for me to spend some time in. Baby, this is Cleveland. It is so much more to us. You can even go to Severance Hall to see an orchestra. Hey.